Today's episode is sponsored by Alone in the Dark, the highly anticipated new reimagination by Pieces Interactive and THQ Nordic. Play as Edward Carnby or Emily Hartwood to explore your environments, fight monsters, solve puzzles, and uncover the true secret of Dorsetto Manor. Our favorite heroes are brought to life by Hollywood stars Jodie Comer of Killing Eve and David Harbour of Stranger Things, who lend not only their voices, but their appearance and their formidable acting skills to the brave protagonists. Experience a deep psychological story that goes beyond the realms of the imaginable, all dreamed up by Mikhail Hedberg, cult horror writer of Soma and Amnesia. The team at Pieces Interactive is supported by monster designer and legendary Guillermo del Toro collaborator Guy Davis, as well as doom jazz legend Jason Conan, who provides his eerie and haunting melodies for the right atmosphere. Alone in the Dark is now available on PS5, Xbox Series XS, and PC. Order your copy now and escape into the dark. Welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Novak, and I'm here to read you a bedtime story. We are finally back to fiction, my friend, after three weeks of true question mark things episodes. I'm so happy to return to taking you away from the real world for a while. Let's dive right in, shall we? This week, we have a story by D.H. Parrish, who was the author of the much-beloved episode, Service Fee. If you haven't listened to that one, I highly recommend searching for it in your podcast app. And tonight, I hope you enjoy Filler. Jessica braked hard as the light changed from yellow to red. There were no cars coming, but she always erred on the side of caution. She drummed her fingers on the steering wheel with her left hand and rubbed her temples with her right. She could feel a headache starting. The medication she had already taken would likely blunt it as it usually did. But the vague aura, the apprehension of what might come, was still unpleasant. She looked ahead at the next intersection, where she was supposed to meet her new patient. You will recognize me, the woman had said over the phone. And she was right. There stood a slim figure in a bright yellow print dress with a matching headscarf, wearing large black sunglasses and holding a white leather clutch purse. She looked as if she had wandered off the set of a 1960s Italian movie, The outfit, meant to hide her identity, was out of place for a Sunday morning on a mostly deserted street in the downtown business district. It was a rather conspicuous disguise. The light changed. Jessica pulled the car up to the curb where the woman was standing and lowered the passenger window. The woman walked over, bent over to put her head almost in the car, and pulled the sunglasses down the bridge of her nose like a fashionable librarian. Are you Jessica? Yes. Terrific. Jessica clicked the button to unlock the door, and the woman opened the car door and glided in. She closed it, looked at Jessica, and pointed forward. Well, let's go. A red light on the dashboard blinked in sync with a recurrent beep. Uh, You need to put your seatbelt on first. Oh, of course. I just get so excited on new adventures. She clicked the seatbelt into place, the restraint making a fashionable black sash across the yellow silk dress. Jessica started driving. Oh, I am just so glad you are willing to do home treatments. The woman began. 
You know, I have never done this before, but Rachel just raved about you when I spoke to her. You know Rachel, of course. Mm Mm-hmm. Jessica grunted. She wasn't sure who Rachel was. Well, Rachel looked so good when I saw her at the gallery opening. I simply had to get her secret from her. And after some evasion on her part about a new massage and smoothie regimen, you know I did. Now when was that? Must have been... June? No. It was April, because it was before the last episode of my show had aired. Could it have been that long ago? (laughs) Time does fly. Now... Tell me your secret. What did you do for her? I can't really say. Jessica evaded. HIPAA and patient privacy. You know. Oh, of course. Discretion. You are doing a great job. That is, after all, why I am hiring you. I don't want anyone asking questions about whether I've had any treatment. It is what I am paying you for. You know, I could go to any dermatologist or plastic surgeon. Indeed, I could get free treatment if I offered any doctor exposure. No offense, but there are a lot more prominent names out there who would love a celebrity like me. But I can't risk being seen going into a medical building. People are always taking photographs and posting them. How would I explain this to all my followers? Mm Mm-hmm. Jessica offered an agreement as the car stopped at another light. She looked at her office building, which was catty corner from where they were paused. She could even see her window. If they just did it at the office, she wouldn't have to spend nearly as much time listening to this, which she knew from experience was not going to get any more enjoyable. Maybe she should persuade the woman to just go to her office It would also be safe there. No one would be around on a Sunday morning. They were practically the only car on the road now. Look, uh, Ms... The woman interrupted. Oh, please. People are often startled to meet me, but you shouldn't be. And you don't have to be so formal. Just call me Phoebe. Jessica hadn't been trying to be formal. She just wasn't able to remember Phoebe's name. Look, Phoebe. What Jessica wanted to say was that they should just do everything in her office. That it would save the drive and be safer, more appropriate. But she said nothing. Jessica. Phoebe pointed ahead. The light changed. We can't wait here all day. Drive. Jessica drove the car onto the highway, while Phoebe continued on. Now my television fans might not care too much if they knew I had work done, but my real mission, and truth be told, the real money, is my brand. Phoebe's Organics, all natural beauty. Nothing artificial, no weird and dangerous chemicals from the medical industrial complex. No offense. Just pure products and pure living. All I need is some janitor taking a picture as I walk out of some office and posting it. And then I have questions to answer and a brand in free fall. Let me tell you, everything you've ever heard about show business being cutthroat, the beauty business is worse. You know, I didn't even bring my cell phone with me so the GPS won't track me. My followers need to know I am still in bed sleeping. In fact, I told them I was on a spa retreat for three days, no internet to recharge. But you, of course, won't say anything. You can't, can you? Jessica was not sure if that was a rhetorical question, but answered, nope, just in case. She caught a glance from her rearview mirror of the black bag sitting on the back seat. It was an old-fashioned medical bag, given to her by her parents upon graduating medical school. It was meant as a thoughtful gift, although it wasn't particularly useful. It would have been nicer to not graduate with nearly $350,000 in debt, and nearly $500,000 when combined with her husband's. 
She had packed it that morning with everything she would likely need. For the entire drive, Phoebe chattered non-stop about her business and brand, assuming through most of it Jessica understood her references and humble brags, which mostly she did not. Jessica just politely occasionally acknowledged the monologue to pretend to be a good listener, which was all Phoebe needed. But Jessica was mostly in her own thoughts. She was always annoyed when patients presumed to address her by her first name rather than call her doctor. They wouldn't presume to do that with a male physician, or maybe this one would. The background hum of her migraine, although held at bay, did not help her mood. Even on Sunday, the drive to her home was a good 30 minutes. If she'd just insisted on doing the injections in the office, she would have been done by now. She was not much up on pop culture. That awareness had been sacrificed on the altar of medical school and residency. But she strongly doubted Phoebe's surveillance concerns. And now she would have to drive her back and listen to this prattle again. Part of the fee, she supposed, but $10,000 was still $10,000. No cut to be shared with her employer. No cut to be shared with the tax collector. Jessica pulled into her driveway. The home was a small, single-family bungalow at the end of a cul-de-sac. Here we are, Jessica announced as she cut the engine. She got out, grabbed the black bag from the back, and went to open her front door. She realized Phoebe was waiting in the car until that front door was open and she could dash in undetected, which is exactly what she did. Jessica considered her neighborhood once Phoebe had dashed past her. No one was watching anything outside here in this part of suburbia. They were safe. Phoebe stood in the entryway, scrutinizing her surroundings. Jessica, anticipating the meaning of this, went to draw the shades in the living room. There. No one can see. My husband is out for the day, watching the game with his friends. It's just us. Have a seat in Lazy Boy. It'll substitute for an exam chair. Phoebe removed her glasses and scarf. Where is the bathroom? Just down the hall. If you're wearing any makeup, please wash it off. Makeup? Please! Jessica went into her kitchen, opened up her bag, and placed the various vials and syringes and needles on her kitchen counter, as well as a white eyeliner pencil and some gauze and alcohol swabs. She heard the toilet flush and the footsteps as Phoebe walked back to the living room and plumped herself down on the recliner. Jessica grabbed a chair, sat across from Phoebe, and took her history. She was 45, in good health, no allergies, and took no prescription medications. Although she consumed a long list of health supplements that Jessica had to look up, fortunately, none seemed likely to cause bleeding or otherwise interfere with a few cosmetic treatments. Jessica examined Phoebe's face and had her frown, smile, and look surprised. She had a traditionally attractive face whose thinness accentuated the creases of the nasolabial folds at her cheeks, and she had the forehead wrinkles one would expect from aging and a history of a bit too much sun on fair skin. There was no marked asymmetry or other features that would require more complex correction or adjustment. This would be easy. So, Jessica started handing Phoebe a mirror. This is what I think we should do. We will put some filler in your cheeks and nasolabial folds. It'll look better pretty soon, reducing those lines and giving you a little lift. You'll look in the mirror and just see a younger you. Now for your forehead, I think we should treat the frown lines with some Botox. Botox? Phoebe said. That's a toxin. I don't want toxins in my body. Jessica pivoted. Okay. What if, instead of Botox, we use a naturally derived neuromodulator to reduce the synaptic muscular response? This will do the same thing. Will that be okay? That sounds better, Phoebe said, 
relieved. Do that. Botox, of course, is just the brand name of a neuromodulator. Jessica was used to this. Give patients the illusion of autonomy and choice, dressed in details that they likely don't understand, but will pretend to, and they will agree to almost anything. In Phoebe's case, this also meant sprinkling in some variant of the word nature. And, Jessica continued, so you know, the filler we are using to help with the lines at your cheeks is a hyaluronic acid, which is something your body naturally makes. We are just replacing some of what time has taken away. Sounds good. I am in your hands, Jessica. Just remember, I can't have anyone know that I am doing this, so it can't look as if I did. Understood. No one will see anything. Now, um, not to be crass, but did you bring the payment? Phoebe opened up her purse and pulled out a packet of $100 bills. All oh, there. Oh, it feels like I'm in Breaking Bad. You know, I was once up for... Great. Jessica cut her off. She took the cash, put it on the kitchen counter, and walked back. Let's get started. Jessica was eager to have this all over as soon as possible. Jessica cleaned off Phoebe's face and marked injection sites on the cheeks and forehead in white eyeliner. She slathered on a topical anesthetic gel and went to the kitchen to drop the medication. She did not want to do this in front of Phoebe, both in case the needles made her nervous and so Phoebe wouldn't see the Botox label. Jessica? Phoebe called out. Yes? Just so you know, I can be a little squeamish around needles. While I was in the bathroom, I took a little something to help my nerves. Some Ativan. That's fine. Thanks for letting me know. Even better, Jessica thought, although she wondered where Phoebe had gotten the Ativan from, and why she hadn't mentioned it when she asked about medications. Although Phoebe probably just didn't think of it as such, since Phoebe didn't take medicines. Maybe, Jessica thought, she'll just sleep on the way back. Jessica gave the topical anesthesia some time to work and then cleaned it off. The cheek injections went off without a hitch. This level of cosmetic treatment is not rocket science. After she finished layering the filler in the cheeks, Jessica realized she had a little extra. The Botox would take a little time to work, but the filler would provide some instant improvement, which Jessica had a feeling would go a long way to Phoebe's assessment of the process. Phoebe had indicated if it went well, she would want touch-ups every three months. $40,000 a year. How did someone make that much money shilling useless beauty products? Phoebe, do you want me to put some filler to treat the wrinkles between your eyebrows? It can do a pretty good job. Phoebe answered somewhat sleepily, but calmly. Sure. Whatever you think is best, I am in your hands, darling. The Ativan had definitely kicked in. Jessica took the needle and carefully and deliberately filled in the glabellar wrinkles between Phoebe's eyes. Jessica stood back to admire her work. Phoebe really did look better, and that last injection was the crowning touch. Phoebe nodded off into a blissful sleep. Normally, Jessica would have gone to get some cold packs out of the refrigerator to put on Phoebe's face, but she really didn't want to risk waking her. The quiet was nice. Jessica went to the kitchen and packed everything up. She then walked back into the living room and thought about waking Phoebe up to go home, but now there was no rush. Even her migraine symptoms had faded. The day was looking up. Jessica made herself some coffee. She drank slowly from her mug, holding it with both hands and savoring the warmth of the steam on her face between sips. All her and her husband's income, not that he was contributing much as a freelance writer, had been going to debt service, rent on this home, and other basics. Now maybe they could take a vacation, a nice vacation. Perhaps France, 
She'd always wanted to go to... Oh, Jessica! Came the voice from the other room, disrupting the reverie. Jessica walked over. They could go now. Yes? Can you turn the lights on? It's dark here. I can't see anything. It was not dark. Oh, shit. Jessica muttered to herself. Jessica, dear, the lights? Jessica rushed over. Phoebe, shut your eyes. Why? Please just do it. Phoebe complied. Jessica pressed her fingers against Phoebe's eyelids, enough to compress the eyeballs. One, two, three, four, five. Jessica counted under her breath, releasing pressure on five, and then restarting the pressure and the count. That hurts. What are you doing? Eyeball massage. Jessica continued, her voice becoming more authoritative. Just stay still. Jessica continued the massage and contemplated the nightmare before her. There is a rare risk of filler causing blindness. It has to enter a relevant facial arterial vessel, enter with sufficient quantity, and enter with enough force that the retrograde flow makes the filler travel backward in that vessel and then move into and lodge in the central retinal artery, where it blocks any blood supply to the retina. Like an unfortunately redirected traffic pattern. It is rare with injections at the nasal labial folds on the cheeks, but more common, but still very uncommon, with injections at the glabella. But it almost always affects only one eye. How could both eyes be affected? How could this have happened? She had used so little filler between the eyes. She had been so careful. There would have to be some very unusual facial anatomy, some unusual arterial anastomosis supplying both eyes through which clotting materials had flowed. One in a million, if that. It would have been hard to do if she were aiming for it. Jessica, the lights? Jessica stopped the massage. Phoebe opened her eyes, and Jessica flicked her fingers at Phoebe. No reaction. Her own head pounded. Jessica took a deep breath. Listen to me, Phoebe. There has been a complication. It's not dark. Some of the filler has somehow traveled to your eyes. What do you mean? It's not dark. The filler is causing the vision problems. Phoebe took a few seconds to grasp this. And when she did, her expression turned to one of terror. Oh oh God, oh God, oh God! Jessica put a hand gently on Phoebe's right shoulder. Phoebe startled, her head turning instinctively in the direction of the touch. Jessica tried her reassuring doctor voice. Phoebe, this is a serious situation. I can handle it, but I need you to stay calm. Can you do that for me? The Ativan probably kept Phoebe from completely exploding or imploding. I am going to lay you back in the chair. Try as best you can to relax. I'm going to get something to fix the problem. But I need you to stay here and stay calm. Can you do that? Without waiting for an answer, Jessica ran to her bag and frantically searched for a vial of hyaluronidase the enzyme that could dissolve hyaluronic acid and any clot. She was sure she had packed it. After five seconds that lasted an eternity, she found it and clenched it in her shaking hand. She took out a syringe and quickly drew it up, almost stabbing herself with a needle in the process. She could hear the heavy bass of her heart beating in sync with the pulses of her headache. Deep breaths, Jessica. It will be okay, she told herself. She walked back to Phoebe, again displaying a facade of confidence. Phoebe, I am going to fix the problem. To do this, I am going to have to do what is called a retrobulbar injection. It means I am going to be putting a needle below your eyes so I can get medication to the place behind your eyes that is causing the vision problem. You will need to stay 
still. Oh God, oh God, do you have to? Have you ever done this before? Yes, Jessica lied. Jessica announced each step to Phoebe before she did it. I am going to clean your eyelids with some alcohol. Now, I am going to place my fingers on your right eyelid. You will feel them resting there. Phoebe held still as Jessica pressed her left thumb and index finger against the bony ridge of the orbital rim below Phoebe's right eye. Okay, I am going to inject the medicine. Jessica positioned herself to direct the needle back, but Phoebe gave a small yelp and flinched as soon as the needle touched her skin, nearly driving it into her eyeball. Jessica pulled back. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Phoebe? Jessica raised her voice. I need you to stay absolutely still. If you are not still, this can get worse. Much worse than you know, Jessica thought but did not say. Phoebe became quiet. Jessica again put her fingers in position and drove the needle perpendicular to Phoebe's face, feeling the slight resistance as it moved below and past the globe, then angled it upward toward the optic vessels. She pushed the plunger slowly and withdrew the needle. Is it, is it done? Phoebe asked tentatively. Yes, Jessica said in triumph. You did great. One side is done, now the other. Jessica repeated the process at the left eye, this time with slightly more confidence now that she had done one. After she pulled out, however, the white of Phoebe's left eye slowly grew redder and redder. Oh shit. A subcorneal hemorrhage? Had she perforated the globe? Jessica thought quickly. Phoebe, I have done what I can do here, and I expect your vision will start to come back soon. But we need to get you to a hospital to make sure you will be okay, in case more care is needed. It definitely was, but Jessica was not going to tell Phoebe that quite yet. I am going to sit you up so I can help you to the car. Jessica was expecting some resistance on Phoebe's part, the secrecy that had been required and all that, but Phoebe showed none. Phoebe took Jessica's arm and walked with her calmly and slowly to the car. There was still no one out and about. For perhaps one minute, they drove in silence, Jessica listening only to the dull pounding in her own head. But then Phoebe started in, quietly at first. How could you do this to me? I trusted you. This is what is wrong with medicine. Jessica tried to deflect. Phoebe, the important thing now is to get you to the hospital. The injections are likely working, they just need time. But if anything else can or should be done, they will be able to care for you. You did this to me. Phoebe continued her voice rising. I trusted you. I trusted you. You failed me. You probably put a toxin in me. I will sue you for everything you have. I will ruin your name. You won't ever walk again. Phoebe kept repeating this mantra, louder and louder each time, like an orchestra playing a theme to a crescendo. Jessica reached the intersection just before the highway on-ramp. She had just missed the light. It was a long light. She had been caught here many times. She looked at Phoebe, who continued to berate her, and looked up at the traffic headed downtown. Phoebe, slight change of plans. There is a backup on the highway. I am going to have to take some back roads to get to the hospital. It may take a little longer, but it'll make sure we don't get stuck. I knew I shouldn't trust you. You can't even drive right. Look. How can I look? Oh God, this is all your fault. Phoebe, I am going to call the hospital to let them know what is coming so we are processed faster. 
I'm going to pull over to do this so we don't get into an accident. Well, you didn't take that much caution with me. Jessica pulled the car over, took out her phone, dialed, and spoke. Hello, this is Dr. Shipman. I have a patient. Don't say my name. I have a patient, a woman in her 40s, with a bilateral embolic central retinal artery occlusion, likely secondary to a hyaluronic acid filler injection. She has had injections of 100 units of retrobulbar hyaluronidase to each eye. She needs immediate attention. Jessica paused and looked at Phoebe. I, I can't give you her name right now. But she should be treated as a VIP and will need a stat ophthalmology consult. We should be there in about 20 minutes. Jessica pulled back onto the road and drove on. Phoebe continued. This is all on you and what you did to me. I should never have trusted you. You are a disgrace. Jessica focused on driving, ignoring or deflecting the comments and giving updates hoping the stream of information might calm Phoebe. We're making good time. It's a good thing we avoided the highway. The roads here are fairly clear. Just five minutes. We're here. Jessica pulled into a parking space and turned off the car. I'll come around and open the door for you. She opened her own door and got out. With my phone call, they should be able to get you right in. It's going to be okay. Jessica opened the passenger door and helped Phoebe out, placing Phoebe's right hand on her left arm. Hold on to me and I'll guide you in. Phoebe held on tightly and, new to blindness, walked somewhat unsteadily with Jessica as her guide. Jessica opened the door and led her inside. It seems quiet for an emergency room, Phoebe noted. ERs are usually quiet on Sunday mornings, especially when there's a game on. It's good news. It means there shouldn't be any weight in getting you treated. Jessica led Phoebe forward slowly. Here, place your hand on the counter. That's right. And wait here. I'm going to speak to a triage nurse. They should have all the details from the phone call and be ready to get you in. In a reassuring manner, Jessica patted Phoebe's hand on the counter. She then grabbed the nearest knife she could find in her right hand and in one swift motion, aiming with the certainty born of hours in anatomy labs, plunged it into Phoebe's left neck. Blood spurted out of the carotid in a fountain. Phoebe screamed and grabbed at the sight, trying instinctively but in vain to stop the flow. For a brief moment, focus came back into Phoebe's left eye. The blood rapidly emptying through the carotid had instantly changed the pressure gradients and reversed the retinal arterial flow, dislodging the filler clot. Phoebe had just enough time to realize that she was not in any hospital before she lost consciousness and collapsed on Jessica's kitchen floor. Jessica looked down at the scene. What had she done? What to do? What time was it? She had to fix this before her husband came home. No one would be looking for Phoebe. Phoebe said she hadn't told anyone. Her followers thought she was on a detox or some such. Phoebe hadn't even brought her phone. She looked at the basement door. She could put the body down there. The basement was unfinished and her husband never went down there. For once, she was grateful that he never did any laundry. It will all be okay, Jessica, she told herself. No one will ever know. All your hard work will not be in vain. You will not lose your license. You will come through this. It will be okay. She opened the basement door, turned on the lights, and went and grabbed Phoebe's legs. She dragged her across the linoleum floor, staining it along the way, and then down the steps gravity causing Phoebe's head and shoulders to hit each stair with a disconcerting series of thuds. She pulled the body off to the side, she would deal with it later, and walked back up to the kitchen. Jessica took in the scene. There was blood everywhere. The ceiling, the countertops, 
Some had even landed on the cash, but mostly on the floor. Jessica's migraine was nearing full bloom, but she had to take care of this. She pulled out a bucket from below the kitchen sink and filled it with water and a few cups of bleach. She got down on her hands and knees, dipped a sponge in the bucket, and began scrubbing. There was so much blood. There was so much to get out. She would have to wash her clothing, too. No one would ever come for her, would they? Phoebe surely had an inflated sense of her own importance, but even Jessica had seen that bright outfit from a block away and knew it was somebody. If she really had such followers, maybe one had stalked her and taken a picture and followed her, hoping to find the retreat. Oh, shit. She jumped up and went to her kitchen window and peered through the blinds. There was a woman just sitting in a car across the street. Did she know her? No, Jessica. Don't be distracted. No one could know. You need to stay focused. Complications happen. They just need to be addressed. Get back to it. You're a professional. She fell again to the floor and to cleaning, rubbing the sponge in circles and squeezing the red gloop into the bucket. Why was it always so much work for her? Nothing ever given to her easily. She was cautious. She did what she was supposed to do, right? Oh, my head. Keep working, Jessica. Oh, there's so much to do. But you have done so much more. You can get through this. How did this happen? Is it just a bad dream? The pain in her head intensified, and she dropped the sponge. She placed her hands tightly over her ears, and curled into a fetal position, rocking herself into unconsciousness. She awoke to someone shaking her shoulder. Jess? Jess, are you okay? A man's voice asked. She rolled over from her side onto her back, opened her eyes, and looked up at him. Jess, say something, are you okay? He took in the scene his wife in their kitchen covered in crimson stains, a washed, streaked film of congealing blood covering the floor where she lay, extending to the basement door. Dear God. She looked up at him, her eyes welling with tears. Not again. Tell me it didn't happen again, he said. She started to cry. He knelt down, pulled her up so she was sitting, and hugged her. It's it's okay, honey. It'll be okay. Where is she? In the basement? Jessica nodded, wiping tears from her eyes. Did, Did you get the money this time? She pointed up to the counter. Well, at least there's that. He stood up. Look, I'll go down and take care of the body. I can just put her with the last one. He stood up. If you're up to it, keep cleaning here. He shook his head at the scene and then followed the blood trail to the basement and disappeared down the stairs. She arose and looked at the bloody mess of her clothes and kitchen. There was still a lot to clean up. For the first time that day, her headache was gone. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much to my author, D.H. Parrish, for another fantastic story. You know, get you a man who will help you hide a body. That's what I always say. Hope to find one of my own one day. (laughs) Thank you for listening. If you'd like to follow the show on social media, you can follow it at ScareYouToSleep on Instagram, Twitter, And there is a Facebook group. There are two Facebook groups, Scare You to Sleep and Scare You to Eat. 
thank you to so we've had a, a lot of people joining scare you to eat after i believe the voicemail episode i mentioned it so welcome all of you new scare you to eaters <laughs> i'm not good with naming people so <laughs> Uh, if you'd like to have a story on the show or uh, considered for the show, just like D.H. Parrish did this week, send it to scareyoutosleep at gmail.com to be considered for the show. There is also a contact submission form on my website, scareyoutosleep.com, if you'd like to use that instead. And, of course, I have to remind you that for as little as a dollar a month, you can get all of these episodes ad-free on Patreon. And for $3 and up a month, you can get bonus episodes. So, if you can, consider supporting the show on Patreon. And if you already support on Patreon, thanks so much. And don't worry, if you listen to the ads, that actually helps me out a lot as well. So, you're already doing awesome you're doing awesome (laughs) not much of a ramble this week folks i think people are a little sick of hearing me talk after the last three weeks but i will say i did end up making my coconut cake i know some of you were so worried i did it was the um sally's baking addiction recipe I did a different frosting. Um, I did, well, I modified her frosting. I didn't do a cream cheese frosting because one of the people I was making the cake for does not like cream cheese frosting because she is crazy. Um, I'm just kidding. If you don't like cream cheese frosting, then, you know, you're valid or whatever, but (laughs) to each their own. Okay. I get it. I will also have a bonus episode coming out on Tuesday, so keep a lookout for that. It is a very, very awesome interview I had the honor to do, so look out for a bonus episode on Tuesday. Again, I don't, I still don't know if I'm allowed to say who it is yet. It's already, it's going to be here soon, but I don't know if I'm supposed to wait till the day. No one tells me anything. I just kind of go with the flow. But uh, Jen Adams and I, and Jen Adams is from the Losers Club, and which is another amazing show on the network. Go check that out. So we got to interview someone awesome, and I can't wait for you to hear it. All right, I'm going to go. I had a weird week, so I'm going to take the longest, hottest bath ever known to man. Uh, I'm going to make sure the water is just below turning to steam that's how i like it just basically boiling and i will see you all i guess on tuesday actually i'll see you all on tuesday but i will see you next week where i have another doozy of an episode for you all right everyone go get some sleep sweet dreams